I want you to turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. This is where Paul is, the Apostle Paul is in Athens, and he is uh, at a place called Mars Hill, a place known as the Areopagus. This is where learned men of the city would go and they would discuss various issues. And if uh, we don't have time to go into the, the whole story of him in Athens, but I want to start with verse, uh, let's see, what is it, third, 22? Boy, it's getting hard to read. And it reads, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is as unknown, thus I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by hand, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him yet he is actually not far from each of each one of us for in him we live and move and have our being as even some of your own poets have said for we are indeed his offspring what did the apostle just do he just quoted two pagans he just quoted two pagans okay and I want to give you the statement this is from Simon Kistemacher who's a, a, a biblical commentator he says, establishing rapport with his Athenian audience, Paul quotes verbatim from two Greek poets. Both writers extol the virtues of the god Zeus. The first one is the Cretan poet Epimenides. Then he goes on to say the second quotation is from the poet Aratus, who lived around 315 to 240 BC, who was a native of Cilicia in Asia Minor. Now, why would Paul do that? I actually have the poem that he's referring to. It's called The Phenomenon. It's the only surviving uh, poem that Eratus ever wrote. Let me just read to you a portion of this because I want to make a point with this. From Zeus, let us begin, him do we mortals never leave unnamed. Full of Zeus are all the streets and all the marketplaces of men. Full is the sea and the heavens thereof. Always we, we all have need of Zeus. For we are also his offspring. Did you catch the little phrase there? For we are also his offspring. That's exactly what Paul is quoting. And he is in his likeness unto men, giveth favorable signs and wakens the people to work, reminding them of livelihood. And it goes on to say, Wherefore him do men ever worship first and last. Hail, O Father, mighty marvel, mighty blessing unto men. Question. Was Paul condoning the worship of Zeus by quoting from this poem? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So we ask the question, as Eric has demonstrated, we like to use Mormon sources. Why? Because Mormons respect those sources. They respect the sources. We may not. But it does not necessarily mean that because something comes from a source that we may not agree with entirely, it does not mean that something said in that source might not have some truth to it. To say that you cannot quote a source because it comes from, let's say, the Book of Mormon or the Doctrine and Covenants or even the Journal of Discourses is what's called a genetic fallacy. You cannot automatically say that something is untrue because that statement happens, happens to be found in a source that we as Christians would not embrace or accept. It's called a genetic fallacy. Don't do that. Don't do that. You should not feel uncomfortable quoting these things, but as I often do when I cite these uh, references, I'll clearly explain, look, I personally don't agree with the, the entirety of the source where this is coming from, but I notice something here. There's something here that I think you need to pay attention to, and then I would proceed to quote that source and challenge them as to whether or not they even believe what their own sources are saying or not. 
Sometimes I agree in principle with what those things are saying. Sometimes I do not agree at all, but the Mormons should. You see what I'm doing here? I'm just using their own material. So let's, let's begin here. I needed to give you that preface. 